Hey guys, welcome back. Uh, we've got, this is it. This is going to be the last video. Okay. No, no questions asked. We're done after this one. Okay. So I'm going to go until we're done. Let's get to it. All right. So I, there was one more slide left in the economic, uh, aspects of after, of life after World War II, and that is the middle class. Uh, there was a lot of, uh, in, since there was in, since there was increased spending, uh, this leads to uh, more people who are attaining wealth. Uh, so this uh, that like so all the people who are spending more money on consumer items, things that are uh, the convenience items. Uh, this is going to lead to, like, like I said, more people getting money. Uh, p you know, people are getting better educations now because of the GI Bill, uh, and just in general, more people are going to college. Uh, so this is going to lead to higher earning jobs. Uh, and then so we we see in the 1950s that jobs started to shift from manufacturing jobs that were we were used to in like the early 1900s over to services which are like white collar jobs so for example like manufacturing jobs are going to be like factory work um you know and and you know, white collar jobs are going to be like office jobs uh, and things like that and so we see this major shift uh in the 50s uh in and which is kind of spawning this huge middle class uh, that pretty much everybody is a part of now. All right. Uh, last up is going to be social and cultural aspects of life after World War II. Lots of stuff to talk about here. Um, but we're going to go ahead and we'll start with uh, the Federal Highway Act of 1956. So this is going to be uh, a, a really like just game changing for the United States. Uh, this is basically Eisenhower. Uh, he passed this law and it stated that they were going to make highways spanning from coast to coast. So not only from like basically from east to west and then from also from north north to south. And the purpose, or at least the, the stated purpose, was to be able to move the military or evacuate cities in case of a, a military attack uh, on one of our, you know, one of the coasts. So uh, that's the major thing. But this is actually going to have a huge benefit for uh, regular people who are going to want to move to the suburbs. So, uh, the again, this is going to lead to an economic boom. Excuse me for a lot of industries uh, which either built the the highways themselves or benefited from the highways. Uh, so again, you're going to see a lot more, uh, you know, a lot of customers, you know, coming in from further away. You're going to see a lot of, you know, I, I, there's a lot of companies, a lot of different companies working on building the highways. Uh, so it's going to be really good for a lot of American industries. Uh, and as I said, this is also going to spawn the growth of suburbs, uh, which is going to, you know, pretty, you know, really change the face of America. Uh, speaking of the rise of suburbia, uh, three million couples were unable to find shelter. Uh, now, a lot of them, that, uh, that sounds really dramatic. Uh, they probably lived with their parents uh, or in some other, you know, living situation. Uh, but the reason was because there just really wasn't enough homes after uh, the, the, like the big baby boom. Like there, they, the population was increasing at such a rate that, you know, people just didn't expect it. They were like, wow, there's, uh, all of a sudden, these there's all kinds of people here, and we're not prepared. So we start pr like producing low, not I don't want to say low income housing because that's not what it is at all. It was mass produced housing. Uh, so this was got, built by a guy named William Levitt, and he built this uh, this mass produced town called Levitt Town in 1957. So you had four models of houses to choose from. And these are your choices right here. And these are all identical, like whatever model you chose, like you, that was, you would get the exact as somebody else, exact same house as someone else who had built that model. Uh, and so you see that, the, like, it's really easy for them to build these quickly and efficiently. Uh, and that is, you know, that, that's part of the reason why the suburbs were booming by this time the 60s roll, rolls around. Uh, also, we have, uh, the, the the Veterans Affairs and then the Federal Housing Association is going to uh, also aid in the home growth. They're going to provide loans to people at, at very low interest rates. Uh, you know, basically just giving these homes away uh, because these there was a lot of there was a, they were in really high demand. Uh, and then by the time they start building these houses that are really easy to build, there's going to be uh, like it's it's easy for them to make a profit off of it, so they don't have to charge an arm and a leg uh, for them. Uh, now the the bad side of suburbia is 
that there is so there's really basically what was happening is that Americans who were moving out of older city homes into newly built homes in outlying areas again that's basically what suburbs are now unfortunately most of those people who are going to be able to afford those new homes are going to be white okay so this is going to lead to what's known as white flight and this is when I say that I mean it's white flight out of the city and then another kind of a, a bad uh, side effect of this is, you know, when I say when I say white flight, when I see when you know when I say these suburbs were going to be inhabited by by white people a lot of the times, uh, this leads to a practice known as redlining. And if you see here, you have a picture. This is kind of like this is a sign that you would see, and you see these X's, okay, um, like, like that are above these houses. And it says, an entire block ru ruined by Negro invasion. Every house marked X now occupied by Negroes. Actual photograph of 4300 West Bell Place. Save your home. Vote for segregation. So in this case, like we're seeing like the, 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 the bad side effect. Again, we're in the 50s. You know, even in 1957, when Brown v. Board of Education had been been in, in effect for two years, uh, that just because the Supreme Court had passed that that ruling doesn't mean that the states automatically have to comply. It's up to the president to make to ensure that every state is complying with the Supreme Court's decisions. So that's one thing that is really bad, and it's obviously it it greatly affected, uh, you know, people like basically. That, you know, if, if there were African Americans that were living in the city and could afford to move out to the suburbs, they would, like this practice of redlining would basically, you wouldn't be able to get insurance, uh, or loans, uh, if you were coming from the inner city area. That's not necessarily just for, like, the, like for African Americans, but African Americans were going to be affected, uh, more so than any other minority group. All right, so our advances of the 1950s, uh, Jonas Salk uh, developed the polio vaccine. Uh, this is really revolutionary because polio was still, uh, you know, a major factor in, uh, you know, in, in as, as far as like early childhood. Uh, I mean, FDR had suffered from it his entire life. Uh, so this is really major. Make sure you guys uh, put a star by that. Again, that's definitely important. Uh, also, transistors were developed uh, during this time. What this does, guys, is this is basically it. It is it, le it basically leads the for the pathway to modern electronics. Uh, transistors are going to allow for smaller uh, portable radios, uh, smaller computers, uh, calculators, anything like that that you can imagine uh, is going is going to help. Uh, you know, just really like electronics to revolutionize uh, the world that we live in today. Again, the mo you think of like modern phones or modern computers, uh, you know, none, none of that would have been possible without the development of uh, the transistor. Uh, the first computers were created during the 50s as well. Uh, a lot of them, especially uh, in America, were going to be used to uh, help uh, put a man into space. Uh, you know, the, they have the, the I IBM is invented, that is an international business machine. Uh, and then we also have in 1959, Alaska and Hawaii are admitted as states. So finally, here we go. It's been, you know, we've gone through, gosh, I mean, even from when you were in eighth grade, 1776, all the way to 1959. So almost 200 years. And we're finally at our all 50 states. So we made it. Awesome. All right, so people in the 1950s. So what you're going to look for here, and again, this picture will tell you pretty much all you need to know. Um, the... Excuse me. Uh, the uh, again, you see, like conformity is really the name of the game in the fifties. Uh, the and again, every like, you're going to want to. Everybody's going to want to kind of be like everybody else. Uh, so that is again, the, you know, people are going to are going to be in the same houses. They're going to wear the same clothes, uh, listen to the same music, TV shows, anything like that. Uh, again, that is. It's just like you know, from the chaos of the forties with the with the World War and everything like that. Again, we see just everybody kind of going back to they're, they're trying to come together uh, one thing that is also going to unite people is going to be religion uh, we haven't really talked about this very much with communism but communism doesn't have a national religion it do actually doesn't there is no religion in communism and they actually think that they're they, they don't even there's some some communist countries or most communist countries don't even really allow religion uh, so religion for the United States now is going to become a separating factor. It's going to say, hey, this is how we're different from them. Uh, and this is, you know, they're going to say this is why we're better. 
uh, you're going to see, like I said, it's, it's going to be crucial in fighting communism. This is where, you know, you see on, on all the dollar bills and the coins, you know, the in God we trust. Uh, also, during this time, uh, we, you hear the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, the and, and again, so like that was developed during the 50s uh, as kind of a uniting tool, uh, you know, and we say it every day at the beginning of second hour just because, well, heck, we, you know, it's, it's, it's good to be a nation united. Anyway, sorry, I don't know what I just blacked out. All right, anyway, moving on. Uh, so mass media of the 1950s, uh, we've got uh, a couple different things. Uh, basically, by 1960, 80% of U.S. families owned a TV. Uh, these, and again, these shows are going to, they are going to be a reflection of modern life, just as current shows today are a reflection of modern life. Uh, so they are going to stress conformity. Uh, you know, things like, uh, Father Knows Best, uh, you know, the, the, uh, the Brady Bunch was a little bit later, but, uh, you know, I Love Lucy, all of that stuff is going to, uh, kind of show you what life would be like in the, in the 1950s. Uh, as TV production prices rise, this is going to lead to the development of commercials. Make sure you guys put a star by that one. Again, you see, you never wouldn't really, you wouldn't really think about that as, oh, you know, why are commercials around? Well, people are trying to make money, but, you know, pretty, you know, running a TV station is not an easy thing. It's not a cheap thing to do either. So commercials are an easy way to get, um, you know, to, to, to make money off of your TV shows. And so the radio is actually like which which was the you know the main uh, form of entertainment uh, up until the 50s. They are going to have to adapt before they are going to uh, you know they're going to do a lot of uh, like they'll they'll do like audio plays and they would you know do a lot of like dramatic readings and of of books and stuff like that uh, and they all kinds of stuff. But now that the TV is around, they kind of have to like shift their focus. So what they're going to do is they're going to play, uh, they're going to play music. They're going to have talk shows, uh, you know, anything else that is going to kind of separate them, uh, from the television because again, the TV is going to dominate, uh, that scene. All right. Uh, so major thing here was the musical revolution. Uh, and this is the development of rock and roll. So rock and roll actually is, it evolves from African American rhythm and blues. Uh, but it is specifically, it became rock and roll when, when white artists, uh, like changed it and it adapted it to their own style. Uh, and one of the major, like, you know, benefactors of this was, uh, was Elvis Presley. And Elvis Presley was very, like, you know, there was a lot of older people, like, during the 50s that hated Elvis Presley because he was, like, he, he, he was acting like somebody that would usually be playing music for African Americans, but he was white. And it was just basically, he was, and again, this is a, uh, not a great comparison, but, uh, if you, you guys know Eminem, Elvis was pretty much the Eminem of the 50s, okay? He used, you know, ba like what usually would be considered an African-American genre, and he applied it, and he was able to make money off of that, uh, you know, in his own, by, by making it his own. Uh, this is going to become the music, the music, the music of teenagers. Uh, this is going to kind of create a generation gap, so you ever, like, when you, when you talk about, uh, like, if if you ever tried to like sh like show and like your like your grandparents like how to do something on a phone or a computer and like or like like you talk about music that they might not listen to uh, that never really happened before the 1950s because everybody pretty much listened to the same stuff there wasn't really anything that uh you know that separated teenagers from every other group like so literally teenagers is cre like like the like the idea of teenagers is created during this time during the 1950s beforehand it was just okay well you're a kid until you are 18 and then you're an adult like there's no middle ground now there is uh and again there's so now tv shows and uh and and companies are going to st start marketing their products specifically for teenagers so things like american bandstand uh that you see in in the movies in the movie grease uh you know or sock hops all these things are going to be specifically uh specifically for teenagers uh because they you know they are now a you know a a dynamic group of people that you can make money from Oh, and then uh, th this is also very important here is that African-American performers became mainstream, which would, had not happened before. Uh, and this and it finally did happen in the 50s as we are you know, slowly progressing out of, you know, the segregation era. 
couple a uh, couple of things here i don't know why this is small that's really annoying me i gotta fix that anyway sorry for that okay uh so again the two i already mentioned elvis chuck berry uh, is also going to be a very famous artist at this time uh and these guys are going to be you know single-handedly uh you know changing the face of music uh we'll talk about this a little bit more in class we'll have uh, i'll play some different music uh music of them for you uh but if you want to hear what it was like Go ahead, take their names, uh, put them into YouTube, and see what pops up. A, little, a couple more artists for you. We got Buddy Holly and the Shirelles. Again, these are they're gonna have have songs that you ha like may never think you would have heard of, but I guarantee you when I play them for you, you'll you'll hear uh, you know some you'll definitely be able to recognize some of the some of the tunes. Uh, and then also Ray Charles and Little Richard uh, were very popular during this time, uh, and we'll talk about them a little bit more in class as well. All right. Uh, 50s family. Uh, first of all, m women typically did not work. Uh, we also, as I mentioned earlier, TV shows are going to popularize uh, the, the family life, things like Leave it to Beaver, Father Knows Best. Uh, all of these shows are going to, you know, they're going to, it's like kind of the first time where we have entertainment uh, who are helping kind of solidify a society's morals. Uh, you know, if you think about shows like Full House, uh, or Boy Meets World, which I know I know are older shows that, that are like from my generation, but you guys have, might have seen them as well. Like those kind of shows where you like you learn about morals and you learn about what's right and wrong. Uh, those kind of shows started back in the 50s, and the, and they kind of have have continued, uh, you know, to permeate through uh, Hollywood even even through even to 2017. All right. Uh, so next up, we I wanted to talk real briefly about the feminine mystique. Uh, in 1963, again, I know that this is not really the 50s, but it's still post, uh, you know, post World War II, which is kind of the theme here. Uh, Betty Friedman, uh, she wrote this book called The Feminine Mystique, published in 1963. It detailed the unhappiness of modern women, uh, which was based on research conducted in the 50s. And this is basically talking about how you know women were not supposed to work; they were supposed to be to be submissive. Uh, they really didn't feel like they had much of a role. Uh, and like like the, anyway, like they weren't expelled. Like I said on the last slide, women weren't expected to work, uh, and that was kind of leading to this profound unhappiness in a lot of different women. Uh, and so this is like this book is going to be the inspiration for women's liberation that we will see in uh, in the 60s and 70s, uh, you know, kind of women becoming a lot more independent. All right. And then last but certainly not least, uh, I think. Yep, there we go. Uh, so the beat generation, or also known as the beatniks, uh, these are people who are going to be kind of against this conformity that I mentioned in the 50s. Uh, so they are going to be, again, it's a movement against materialism, against conformity. So they don't want, again, they like it's, they see materialism and conformity as bad. They are re kind of rejecting the norms of American society. These are going to be the people who are going to, they're going to stress spontaneity. They want to be spontaneous. They want to live freely. They want to just enjoy their lives. Um, a couple examples of that are going to be Jer Jack Kerouac's On the Road and then Allen Ginsberg's Howl. Uh, and these are just really good examples of what the, the quote unquote beat generation uh, would, would uh, you know, would it, how how you would imagine them acting and if you want to think about it like uh from greece like the uh, whatever the main character's name is out of the guy john travolta's character in greece he would be like the the perfect example of the beat generation just kind of rejecting everything uh that uh and he didn't even really do anything bad that bad in greece but he just wasn't he was kind of uh, you know working against everything else anyway guys that's all i got for you i believe that's it yep we're done thank you so much see you next time